Hello, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm Yelena Sudakova, Director of Brad. And I'm extremely honored and privileged to introduce to you these two extraordinary superwomen, <laughs> two pioneers in, in art, uh, two role models for me, and really uh, two individuals who keep inspiring me and many others. Uh, Ivona Blazvik, a groundbreaking curator, author of numerous artists' monographs and uh, director of the Whitechapel Gallery, and Zilfira Trigulova, a revolutionary director of the Tretikov Gallery, <laughs> and uh, really, uh, you know, an advocate for international exchange. And uh, paraphrasing yet another superwoman, she is really making the impossible possible in these very difficult political times. Uh, and so thank you so much to both of you for so kindly and generously agreeing to launch our show. And, uh, well, I'm going just to ask a few questions which relate to your careers and our show and bring those together. And then hopefully I will be able to open it up to the audience and each of you will be able to ask your own questions. And so you belong to the same generation. You were born on the same year, on the two different sides of the Iron Curtain. And your career started off approximately at the same time. And so my first question is, uh, what image did you have of each other's cultures? What informed it? And how has that been transformed? Zilfira, you go first. OK, as for the image which we had of Western culture, I must admit that in Soviet times, you had the chance, you couldn't travel abroad at all for me to um, like believe that I will once see the National Gallery in London would be like the same level of possibility as to see the backside of the moon. <laughs> but, but, no, I, I, I mean it. But at the same time, uh, in my apartment and in apartments of many of my schoolmates, there were huge bookshelves with complete editions of all of the major British, American, French, German writers, poets. There were albums, um, which we were collecting and trying to buy them in the bookstores uh, about the National Gallery in London, and about the collection of the Louvre. So I would say that we were quite well educated. Also, I had graduated from a secondary school with intensive English learning. I never took any courses of English after I had graduated from school. So it was very high level of teaching, by the way. Uh, but our courses at the university, which I entered at the age of 16, that's, that's the system in Russia. You come to school when you are six, then you graduate at 16, and then you are to decide what you are to do in this world. Uh, so um, uh, um, when uh, um, I have uh, entered uh, the university and we studied art history, we studied everything beginning with Altamira Hayes. But coming to the 20th century, the last lecture, which lasted for two and a half hours, was uh, the lecture on Le Corbusier, uh, and uh, Matisse and Picasso. And that was like late 30s. That's it. After that, there was nothing, zero. Mm. Uh, so I graduated from the university, went to postgraduate courses. Um, I didn't have any idea what is happening in the contemporary art world in the world. Mm. Then, uh, um, I got married and got two children, so for six years after postgraduate courses, I didn't work, I was a mother and a wife. And did nothing except for that. Reading books, of course, at the time when it was possible, when I was not nursing my children or walking them, because being a typical Soviet wife and having a typical Soviet husband, I was to do everything. Uh, so, and, and then I started working, and it happened so that I came to an institution which was in a kind of an executive organ of the Minister of Culture of then the Soviet Union. It was late 80s, and Perestroika just had started. And one of the first projects which 
I started to work on being its general coordinator was exhibition The Great Utopia for the Guggenheim Museum. Uh, it was shown in Frankfurt at uh, Schönkunsthalle and at the Stedlich, and finally, without Western loans, in Moscow at the Tretikov Gallery. Uh, and this brought me, for the first time, outside of Russia, abroad, uh, to Frankfurt, Amsterdam, and finally in New York. And I had an incredible chance to get a seven-month scholarship from the Guggenheim Museum. And then it was a new university for me because the whole world of contemporary art had opened to me. And I was trying to be a very thorough student. Every Saturday and after the working hours, I was trying to go to Soho then. Chelsea didn't exist yet to the galleries on the 57th Street. Reading books in the New York um, Public uh, Library, educating myself, and the whole new world opened to me. Plus to that, the Guggenheim uh, director, Tom Krenz, who wanted me to get the first-hand knowledge of how the museum world operates in America. He put me to sit these, during these seven months in the office of his then deputy, Michael Govan, who is now the uh, director of LACMA. And so I was witnessing how Michael is doing what he was doing in the most sophisticated and bright way. And that's what I learned, plus to what I learned about the world of contemporary art. I learned how to deal with the people, how to talk to the journalists, uh, what is the priority, how to talk to those who are ready to give you money, but you need to say something that they would be doing that, feeling that they are happy and honored to do that. Um, so that's what was my former experience, and uh, uh, that is how it had changed. Moreover, at that time, my elder daughter was a very uh, uh, like complicated teenager, uh, un terrible, really. And um, the Guggenheim allowed me to brought her to New York for a month. And we were staying in different families. I was taking around her around. All of my friends there were trying to take care of her, to take her everywhere where she wanted to go. And one night when we stayed at the house of my uh, friends, she started crying. I said, what is happening? She said, mother, I couldn't imagine that people in the family could be so kind and nice to each other. Why we are so cruel to each other? Uh, and that's what I'm saying, because we are discussing this subject. All that situation in which we, we were during Soviet times and during uh, the 80s and the 90s, it led to the situation when relations in the family were very complicated, because a woman was, a woman was so overloaded with all of the burdens that she couldn't be like calm, nice, and relations in the family, in Soviet families, and that's what I really could compare, were always much more hostile, because it was the question of survival. So. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Ivona. I had, I had three different um, uh, kind of impressions of what was called life behind the Iron Curtain. There was that phrase. And one was personal because my family were displaced by the Soviets. So their memory was a very bitter and unhappy one. And they ended up in a labor camp. You know, so it was a, there was a, an almost taboo about speaking of Russia from my Polish family. So there was that subject of, of um, deep trauma, actually, that characterized their relationship with the legacy of the Soviet Union. The second, I would say, was cultural. And first of all, there's James Bond. <laughs> and uh, we grew up on James Bond movies where there was this evil uh, organization called Thrush, which was uh, located in Moscow. And Moscow was a, a, a mysterious snow-covered place uh, where there were many spies and um, uh, you know, uh, plotting military and so forth. So that was one <laughs> and another one. 
But then there was also Dr. Zhivago, and another a seminal film, which I grew, you know, which I watched as a girl, and there was the romantic Russia of the great Dakas and the huge plains and the, the tremendous beauty and the legacy of 18th and 19th century Russian culture, uh, a huge intellectual legacy. Uh, we all read Dostoevsky and we all loved Gogol and so on. So it was, it was this very kind of fractured uh, legacy or image. But the third was, of course, aesthetic and falling in love with constructivism. Right. You know, and that, for me, throughout, even as a student, the legacy of Malevich, which finally we could celebrate in an exhibition at the Whitechapel Gallery last year called The Adventures of the Black Square. And that was always for me, and funnily enough, my family, who were architects and dedicated to modernism, this utopian aesthetic was one of the most powerful driving forces in our understanding of modernism, of a, an alternative legacy of abstraction, of the rise of montage, of uh, cinema, Gigavertov, and so forth. So it's a, it's a very multiple and mostly fictitious, I think, <laughs> legacy. And then finally I was able to visit this place called Russia a couple of years ago, and of course it was completely different from any of those um, myths, really, that we all led with. So much more complex, much more human, and, and of course, uh, much more um, subtle and nuanced, you know, where all of these histories and modernities come together. Yeah, yeah. But uh, in, yes. can I add, uh, I didn't tell you that my grandfather spent 22 years in Gulag, and the grand, another grand-grandparent of my children was executed in 24 hours on Lubyanka as a German spy. Mm. So it's again something common. But yeah, but kind of continuing, of course, avant-garde and revolution, you go, go hand in hand. And, uh, and so our show begins with the revolution, with Lenin saying that there can't be any social changes until woman is liberated. Which, which they did, and by 1923, all women in the Soviet Union received equal rights. And in that term, kind of coming back to the avant-garde, uh, I know both of you, as you have mentioned, have addressed this uh, topic in your curatorial practices several times. And uh, uh, it would be interesting to kind of explore it historically, starting with uh, Zilfira, because she curated um, a seminal show, Amazons of the Avant-Garde, in the Tretikov in 2002. And uh, I wonder if you could tell us more about it and uh, why, why then, what was the social sort of response to it? And it went to the Royal Academy, that show. Yes, it was in 2000 uh, in three venues at the Guggenheim, mm -hmm. starting with uh, the Deutsche Guggenheim, and then ended up at the Royal Academy. Mm -hmm. And then after that, uh, it went to the Tretzikov uh, Gallery. Yeah, it's, it's really an amazing thing when you think about where were women's rights in Russia at the end of the uh, 19th century, where um, all right-minded women were to go abroad to study, and the extent to which uh, women were not considered to be a kind of a free a uh, free person was that up to the end of the 19th century there were no female models in the Academy of Arts, only male. So uh, many of uh, the artists of the turn of the century and of uh, the first two decades, female artists went to study abroad like Lyubov Popova, Alexander Exeter or Nadezhda uh, Udaltsova. Uh, they studied in Paris, they studied in Munich, and then, in the second decade of the 20th century, we are witnessing incredible creativity uh, on the side of women. Uh, and you cannot compare this to any other country uh, in the world at that time. It was phenomenal, and we can see also the works of some women artists here done later in the 20s 
and uh, the uh, 30s. And we wanted to explore that and to show that what they had suggested as creative ideas, how they embodied these ideas, was no less strong than what their male partners. By the way, each of these six incredible women had their male partners who were artists too. So how creative these women were and to which heights of creative expression they had uh, reached. Uh, but the starting point for this exhibition was a very funny one. We were going during the Great Utopia with my friend uh, around uh, New York and we saw at the Guggenheim Soho um, a poster. Tom Krenz, you are not exhibiting women. And we looked at each other and said, oh, okay, it's a great idea. <laughs> we should suggest it to him. And we can realize what we wanted to do with, with uh, showing these women artists. And he can get all of the pluses for showing women artists. <laughs> <laughs> but to us, this was a strange idea, though. So this was uh, Gorilla Girls, was it? it was yeah, Gorilla absolutely. Girls. Oh. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. absolutely. But the idea seemed to us strange to show somebody because of the sex. And to show that women, like, could be artists too. Um, again, with so many strong women artists in the 20th century, in uh, post-revolutionary Russia, the idea that that is a kind of a wonder mm -hmm. didn't occur to us. Yeah, but Gonchirova we was didn't, the first. Yes, artist. and plus to that, yeah, with Goncharova. Yeah, in, in uh, 1913, she was the first out of all the avant-garde artists who had her own personal show with 800 paintings on display. So that's an interesting uh, sort of notion. And at the same time, she was uh, um, a partner and, uh, of Mikhail Larionov, no less gifted and talented artist. But it's, it's a permanent discussion, who is stronger? <laughs> she or Larionov or Rochenko and Stepanov or Kruchonov or Rosanova. Um, uh, so, but anyhow, the idea seems strange to us, but we thought it's a good point to do what we wanted to do. Okay. And uh, readdressing uh, this question, but in a different way, in uh, um, avant-garde as a sort of social upheaval. And we, of course, know that the institutional and cultural contexts you know, are very different here in the UK. And uh, for many reasons, but uh, partly uh, because of the second and third wave of feminism, which never had that impact in the post-Soviet society. And uh, what I'm interested really is in your recent statement, uh, feminism is cool once again. And you were quoted saying that in the Financial Times, uh, and the attention that the female artists are now receiving. And so I wonder uh, sort of uh, where do you stand in this? There is this debate about the quota approach to the representation of the female artists. And so it's interesting to know your views on that. Well, I think it's a consciousness-raising uh, device um, because quite often it's something unconscious when, when um, people are you know, putting together group exhibitions or whether they're planning their program or where the, the way they hire their staff, the way they construct their boards, uh, all of these things. There is, in this society anyway, an assumption that Men come first somehow, and it's often unconscious. And it's when you have to stop and think, hang on a minute, you know, why isn't it 50 50? It's then that you think, actually, yes, we've let one gender dominate because they always have. So they become, it's a self fulfilling prophecy. You know, if it's always the same person, then uh, institutions will replicate that, in my experience. And so I think there is a very positive aspect to that of actually just making people stop and think and actually not take the easy, lazy way, but really consider why isn't this, why doesn't this reflect society? Um, so, you know, I, I think it's a, an important strategy. In terms of the market, um, yes, now finally women artists are getting some parity, but my sense is, uh, that it's partly because 
the market is always hungry for the new, and at the moment, old is the new new. So suddenly there's a whole revisionist thing, not because there's some great wellspring of feminist art theory, but no, because the market's hungry for the unknown. And so, you know, suddenly uh, a, 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 an artist like Phila de Barlow has been working under the radar for 30 or 40 years because um, actually a, a gallerist like Ivan Berth, who I really admire, actually, decided that this was a very important body of work that that needed to have more exposure. And suddenly the world wakes up and says, oh yes, you know, maybe she could represent Britain at the next Venice Biennale, you know. So it, I think there is a, a cynical part of that, which is that the desire for fresh inventory, you know, of course. Um, but nonetheless, if you look at the prices, they're still significantly less than their male counterparts. So it's not, the battle by, has, no, has not been won but it's, it's, it's gradually getting there. I think also because there are many more women collectors. I mean, there have always been great women collectors. Uh, Gertrude Whitney, I mean, so many. Uh, Peggy Guggenheim. Um, but now I think there is the desire to reflect one's own subjectivity um, and to, to show a different kind of experience, a lived experience of the world. And, so there are collectors in this city, like Valeria Napoleone, who only collects women artists. Um, and so I think she's making a difference. She's actually using her you know, financial power, if you like, to, to build a, a, body, a really amazing body of work. And then the institutions are changing slowly, also because the curators that they're appointing are changing. You know, organizations aren't monolithic. They do and can change. And we've seen a, a radical change in collecting institutions like the Tate, which 20 years ago had virtually no women, but now, I would say, has a tremendous and important body of work. I mean, of course, they had the Barbara Hepworths and so on, but I think all of these changes have come really quite quickly over the last two decades. Right, and it's kind of really nicely tying into that. You're also a pioneer of this local and global discussion and, and discovering new geographies and coming back to Tate, this is, we, we see new narratives emerging finally. Uh, but it's interesting that it is this, this narrative of, of kind of global, international, transnational art is also um, appearing here in the West. Yes. What, what, what do you think about that? Well, I think the kind of increasing we're, we're living in a much more cosmopolitan world. We have the internet, we have cheap travel, cheap air travel, um, a kind of much more global sensibility. Um, so what's been interesting is also seeing how that's impacted on, for example, art history. Mm -hmm. So as we've seen artists from the Middle East, from Latin America, Africa, India, um, the Asian subcontinent coming to prominence, what they've also done is found their own histories are missing. And we've seen, for example, a tremendous rise demonstrated here in, for example, interest in archives. Why have archives become so sexy? These dry, dead things in boxes. Why are they such a powerful force in contemporary art? You know, if you think 100 years ago to Malevich, what did he want to do? A tabula rasa. He wanted to wipe clean the past. He wanted to jettison history. What are artists today doing? They're going back through history. And I think that's because in this global reality, there are so many artists for whom there are huge lacunae. In the canon does not represent their mm. histories. You know, if you think of artists in the Middle East, of decades of colonialism and civil war, uh, artists in uh, Latin America who lived through the hunters, you know, who lived through the disappearance of tens of thousands of their citizens. Uh, artists living in post-partition um, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, all of these places which have had the tremendous upheavals and have also suffered the hierarchy of colonialism, of being absolutely marginalized. All of these kind of uh, figures are wanting to retrieve those histories and put them back into play again. 
And so that's why I think at the moment, art history itself is one of the most exciting disciplines in, in academe. Mm -hmm. uh, the history of exhibition making is becoming very, very important as a form of art history. Um, and I think the, the, the archive itself of retrieving that, um, but with a kind of artistic nuance in the way that Walid Rad, a great Lebanese artist, made the Atlas group a non-existent group mm -hmm. who were retrieving um, the Arab image archive, for example. So it's a very interesting time, I think, in the way that we are revisioning the, particularly the 20th century. Yes, and Zilfira, of course, uh, during the Soviet times, the Tretikov was the center of accumulation of uh, art from different republics. And so has the time maybe come to kind of re rethink, reinterpret those collections? Because now it's the great historical material. Uh, yes, it's, it's uh, an interesting uh, question. We really have incredible holdings of the art of what was once called Soviet Socialist Republics. It's all very well reflected on the videos which you are uh, showing how European type art started to like, develop there and how they had combined these European traditions with uh, something uh, which was considered to be a national tradition. The question is to which extent it was a national tradition or not something invented by Soviet officials to keep the label of national. But um, in fact, we have the best holdings of the art of uh, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenia, uh, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Georgia, uh, Belarus, Ukraine, uh, Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia. Collections from 60s, 70s, 80s, which are better than what their national museums are holding now. Because the best works of these artists, which were shown at all Union exhibitions in the Big Manage in the center of Moscow, the, the best works were purchased for the needs of the State Tretikov Gallery. Um, we are planning in 2022 to do an exhibition under the title Soyuz Nirushim Republic Svobodnik. I can't translate that the first a line the in, the, in the Soviet the hymn. hymn, the unbreakable union of free republics. But it doesn't sound really uh, poetic, but that's a literal translation. Showing these uh, national schools, and we already started this process with an exhibition which is due to open in the fall, showing the art of uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, and I think <coughs> with these exhibitions and with presenting this art, we will get back to this discussion about national and we would say global, at that time it was Soviet, uh, but national specific and how it was reshaped during the overall rule of Soviet official ideological system. Mm -hmm. And I think this could bring very interesting uh, results. There was a great show, um, if I might just yes, add, please, please. Um, at Calvert 22, which was looking at the impact of Soviet cinema in Africa. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was absolutely revelatory, yeah. that many uh, young communists in Africa in the post-colonial period looked to Soviet Russia as a way of creating a new cinematic aesthetic mm -hmm. and there was a huge exchange between you know Moscow, Mozambique, all sorts yeah. of different groups who many many people went and studied in Moscow mm -hmm. and I think that's another kind of untold story which yeah. is how yeah. this kind of cultural exchange happened outside of any Cold War divisions you know and that the legacy of someone like Jigar Vertov then lived on in independent African mm -hmm. cinema. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, there's a lot of very interesting research yes, around ab that. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, so it's the question of China. For example, the beginning of the traditional oil painting in China is 49 with Soviet teachers who came there. So and it's very interesting how they were mixing these Soviet traditions mm -hmm. with, with some meticulous 
Métier. <laughs> and what came out of that? Okay, well, our next stop is education, because, uh, yes, there, there was, and we reflect on that during, in the show, uh, this sort of illiteracy liquidation, because in 1913, there were only 14% of uh, literate people in Russia, while by 1930, it was almost 100% you know, literate. So that the, the education he played a huge role. And in this respect, I want to ask both of you about art education in your uh, cultures. And uh, I will, will start with Zilfira. And about, about contemporary art education, that is what <laughs> interests me most. Uh, you mean today or about today. education so, uh, no, in I mean contemporary today. art? What's the education in contemporary art yeah. in, in Russia today? What it was like 30 or 40 years ago, I already have told you. Yeah. Um, uh, and you could get information or images of the great artists of the second half of the 20th century only in the books entitled Soviet Ideology Against Bourgeois, uh, bourgeois Art or something like that. Um, it, it's, it's a rather complicated issue because when I'm talking to my colleagues from the West, um, they are trying to um, like bring um, old art to contemporary conception in order to um, vivify the uh, uh, interest in the old art. In Russia, it's totally uh, different. I can give you the figures. Our museum presents its collection in two buildings. One is the old classical building of the early 20th century uh, with collections from 11th to the early 20th. Uh, and the attendance uh, was, before I came, uh, 1 uh, million 100,000 visitors a year. Mm -hmm. uh, another huge building is the installation of the 20th century art with the black square composition number seven by Kandinsky, greatest works by all these women artists, Malevich and Kandinsky and Rochenka. So the attendance when it came for 2014 was 296,000. Less than, more than three times less. Mm -hmm. And that is showing how people are conceiving or understanding art in our uh, country. I think these are really dramatic uh, figures. We try to do everything what is possible during these 15 months uh, to bring attention of our people and our audience to the history of the 20th century art in its most radical avant-garde um, uh, face and to show contemporary art because there we are showing the art up to the beginning of the 21st century, showing men and women, not because they're men and women or women and that we are to proportion them, depending on their input. Um, and these efforts <coughs> resulted, by the way, in more than doubling the attendance of that building within one year, and now we are again raising the attendance figures. But it's very hard to get people there because they don't understand contemporary art. They need some introduction to it. They, ne they need to be helped. Uh, and that's a problem because we are not used to, to interpret contemporary art in the museum uh, world. It's for the galleries, for biennales, and that is a problem because my example is an example of a sophisticated art historian, and still I was to compensate this huge gap in knowledge, not speaking about the understanding. So what we are trying to do now is to do kind of complex programs of, with special events, trying to bring young people to get them accustomed to this contemporary aesthetics, which sometimes looks for them cool, and then through that, getting them deeper into the essence of what is happening today, 
of what was happening in the art of the Russian avant-garde. Because, you know, so many people coming in front of the black square saying, okay, I can do that, my son can do that. And you are to explain why he can't, and the son can't, and why it is the greatest work, the most emblematic work in the whole of the 20th century. And we are starting to teach them to be proud that this most radical work was created in Russia on the basis of accumulation of all of the contemporary trends of Western European art, but giving to it a new impetus and giving absolutely another level of the concept mm. of what art is. And what's the situation that, that Wilfira describes similar 30, 40 years ago in oh, the UK? Yeah, it was, it was a wasteland. And, um, I remember we made, when I was at the ICA, Institute of Contemporary <laughs> Arts, and we had an exhibition of a great Canadian artist called Jeff Wall. Mm -hmm. But he was Canadian, he was foreign. And at the opening, we had a total of 16 people, eight of whom were members of staff. <laughs> it was, um, he actually vowed never to come back. But anyway, um, it's been, uh, we were very parochial, uh, very um, great artists, of course, but very little engagement from a wider public. And I think the key there is the media. Um, you know, in uh, the past, the press would use contemporary art as a kind of whipping post. Mm. Some of the most extraordinary um, headlines um, have been published on everything <coughs> from Mary Kelly, the dirty nappy scandal, Carl Andre, mm. the brick scandal, to Damien Hurst and Tracy Emin, mm -hmm. the unmade bed scandal, the pickled shark scandal, and so on and so on. But um, I think there were three big shifts, tectonic plates. One is the Turner Prize. Mm -hmm. And I think we're a, na we're a betting nation. You know, we <laughs> like to take a gamble. And even though it's a horrible process for artists to be in this ridiculous race, I don't know if any everybody here knows, but you know you can bet on the Turner Prize. You can take odds in William Hill betting shop every year. And um, the Brits love a bet. So uh, it was quite striking that there would always be shock horror, Rachel White Reed, cast building, is this art, you know. But it changed, and I was there at Tate when Tracy Emin displayed her unmade bed, shock horror. And the BBC were filming outside as people came through to look at this crazy installation. And as you know, there were three other artists on display. So the BBC jumped on people coming out saying, what do you think of that? Expecting them to say, ah, oh, rubbish, it's all a con, you know. But no, not one person came out of that unmoved. It was amazing. And I watched 15 very, very arsy school kids going in, <laughs> cool as you like. All they wanted to do was go outside and smoke. And they were frog marched into that installation by their art teacher and they did not want to leave. It absolutely spoke to them, you know. So that, at that point, I think the press suddenly understood that they, they couldn't play to public prejudice anymore because the public had shifted. And they were going into the Turner Prize and thinking, not is it art, but which one would I vote for? It was about that choice of which is the, of the four would I bet on, in a way. So there was that. And also Channel 4 filmed it. So it was on a nationwide media, and it was one of the water cooler tests. What do people speak about the next morning in the office at the water cooler? Well, it was the Turner Prize. So that, it was, they borrowed from the Hollywood Oscars, of course, but I think that made it a much more popular and acceptable activity mm -hmm. to like and think about contemporary art. The fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square has also played its part, mm -hmm. where there's a competition, there's six runners up, and then this thing sits on the plinth for a year. And it's part of the public consciousness. And there we have the taxi driver test. Uh -huh. And when cab drivers start talking about contemporary art, then you really know you've made a difference. <laughs> and then, of course, Tate Modern. And that has been the biggest impact of all. And I think, again, it's 
it's about spectacle. And I know many of my peers in the contemporary art world are very suspicious of that. But I'm thinking, you know, if it engages a public, actually, that's the first step, is to embrace the public. The actual proportions of the turbine hall, it's so vast. And the dynamic of going down into it, you kind of almost forces you to run, to accelerate as you enter the space. It's irresistible. Mm -hmm. And it's free. You know, so that, uh, unlike all our European counterparts or our American counterparts, mm -hmm. where you have to pay, and in MoMA it's $25, it's free. It's amazing. Um, and so I think those three things have shifted public awareness perception. And now it's, a, it's a pop, the most popular activity after shopping. Um, you know, it's rivaling. Um, what's that terrible place? West, Westfield. Westfield, you know. Um, it's now the second most popular activity. And it certainly has outstripped football. By, by a long shot. We did, there was a big survey made. My, many, many more people go to museums than, than go to football matches. So that, in Britain, is a you know, revolution, really. Yeah, yes. um, so I think it's a wonderful moment for, for contemporary art. And as everybody says, you know, these museums are secular cathedrals. They're places where people can meet. Yeah. Um, they're places where people come to pick people up. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's irresistible, these spaces. So I think it's... Uh, these combination of factors, actually. Mm. Yeah. I, I agree with you absolutely about the place museums are taking right now. But as for the media, I would say that if there was a choice to write about a retrospective of a famous 19th century artist at the Tretikov or about the contemporary exhibition in a gallery, it would be the essay on the exhibition of a contemporary artist <coughs> in a gallery in Russian media. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, well, that's, that's it's vice versa. Oh, it's vice versa. Really but as for the free entrance, it's really a mighty vehicle. And that's how we raise the figures also at this new building presenting the 20th century collection. We just introduced one day free, and the attendance during that day is 10 times higher than oh. on a regular day. Okay, well, and then to finish off, uh, just you know, talking about the double burden, which we are exploring in the woman's double burden, work and home. And that comes, of course, that, that's an, I, that comes from the subtitle of this Dynekas post, uh, you know, to um, work, build, and do not whine. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> what do you think of this double burden of the woman's life today? Oh. Is it relevant? Has that question been resolved? As they said in the 1930s, it has been resolved. Yes. <laughs> um, no, it definitely has not been resolved. Um, if we are speaking about women who reached some kind of a status or a peak of their career, of course in Russia they can afford a babysitter, they can afford a woman who is cleaning the apartment, who is cooking for them and for the husband because Russian husband, husbands are accustomed while they are coming home from the office to have borscht on the table, or something cooked freshly, by the way, not uh, something left from yesterday. Um, but if we are speaking about the majority of people, um, like ordinary people, especially in the province, it's incredible burden. Double burden because they are to work, to uh, bring their input into the family's budget, they to take care of the children, they to take care of the husband, again, of the hu husband's parents, and also, as we are going through very hard times now, the situation is rather unstable, and it seems to me that male mentality is much less stable than the mentality of women, who always feel this incredible responsibility for at least the children. Uh, so also the duty of a woman is to, like, to calm down the husband and to make his life psychologically comfortable. <laughs> so that's how, how I see it. <laughs> um, but again, I think things are changing, but you cannot consider Moscow being the whole country.
country. In Moscow, it's different, but in the province, it's as it was. That's, that's my feeling. And the worst is in the villages, mm -hmm. where women are to do all of the hard work, and men are mainly hard drinkers. <laughs> no, no, that's true. Yeah, I think, you know, it's not dissimilar. It's, it's about class. It's about affluence, um, and here even location. Uh, we know that in the north of the country where it's a post-industrial um, society which has two or three generations of unemployment, um, it's very, very tough for women there. I think also within the art world for women artists, um, it's very tough because there's a certain point when you think, well, should I have a family? And you know you're going to disappear. You know, that if you're not constantly working, constantly present, constantly having representation, it's such a, a, a kind of huge world and very competitive and increasingly, as we know, global. To take that decision means to take a break from your career. That, that could be the end, actually. Mm -hmm. That could mean you disappear forever. So I think managing that is, is tremendously difficult. The... the what I don't see as a burden is having uh, kids. I have a, a daughter, and um, it's an absolute delight because there is a wonderful generation of young feminists, and also boys and girls, by the way, and that's very important. Um, and then a very interesting new uh, phenomenon, which is questioning gender altogether, mm -hmm. uh, of asking why do we need to be called he or she? And those kids are asking that question which I find very progressive, very exciting, and I hope that they'll keep that. At the same time, we had three young women, 15 years old, leaving the East End of London to go to Syria, to go back to a medieval patriarchy of violence and subjugation. And we have to ask ourselves why. What was it that attracted them? Why do they feel so disengaged, so disenfranchised from a contemporary society? What called them? to that decision. And they're living, you know, they came from a school a mile away from the Whitechapel Gallery. And I think that's another thing that we have to look at, is what, you know, the conditions in which they live, their, their sense of being alienated from a Western society, mm -hmm. the, the desire for a kind of adventure, uh, an eros, if you like, uh, the kind of lure of being a jihadi bride, what, what does that mean? Why are young women right around the East End adopting the veil? You know, which to me is a symbol of subjugation and denial of, of being in public space, and so on and so on. So I think we're in a, it's a paradox. We're seeing both tremendous progress, uh, a tremendous liberalization, and then this kind of weird, backwards looking medievalism embraced in the same society. It's, it's a paradox. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Let's open it up to the audience. <laughs> say like somehow tradition which was established I think even in pre-war I mean World War II uh, time but also when I entered the university during the first lecture our professor told us be prepared that you will be getting the salary of a woman who is cleaning the floor it was the minimal salary the salary of the art historian and uh, a member of the museum staff I entered the university in 72, graduated, postgraduate courses, 81, was the lowest in the country. So uh, somehow maybe due uh, to that, or at some point the, um, to enter the university and to enter the Department of Art History was almost incredible task 
because after all exams were passed, we had 25 candidates to one place. Um, and it's, it's a, a difference in salary and a difference with, with this incredible interest. Um, so quite uh, wives or daughters of uh, quite established people could afford studying for their own interest, for the interest of developing their personality. And I must admit, really, these studies and then this involvement in fine art was something which helped to survive uh, because it was a world where no rules of uh, official ideology like prevailed. You were to follow certain superficial rules, but otherwise it was your world. Um, it's not a good tendency because I think that there should be men in the museum uh, world. Uh, but somehow with uh, the profession of an art historian or a curator in Russia, it's more for uh, women. And I'm now trying to hire new staff members. And believe me, we are talking to different people who don't consider the gender to be something of importance. But the brightest people whom I meet with younger generation are, again, women. <laughs> I'm sorry to say that. I, I wonder, do you think, because of the Soviet uh, stress on secularity, do you think that made a difference? Because it's, it, I mean, I know I, that religion and now has re, there's been a resurgence, but in a way, you know, religions are so patriarchal. I, I just wonder if the, the kind of deny, you know, the, the fact that it was an insistence on a secular society that also enabled you know, um, equality. Again, uh, so many people, even like with my generation, who wanted to go to the church, they were going to the church. Um, so, and at the same time, we were brought up as atheists. Mm -hmm. And if you are an atheist, if your parents are an atheist, you are an atheist, it's, it's very hard to, to, to get back. So traditionally, in many of the families, these religious, uh, like traditions, sorry, uh, to repeating that word, well followed up in those families where people wanted to follow them up. But generally, we didn't consider it as, as something important. Do you want to answer about the male domination, yeah, the male of domination. The museum directors here in Great Britain? Yeah, I think it came from, because it was um, public museums were civil service uh, <laughs> positions, so it was part of a kind of broader, um, you know, it was a career structure. There would be uh, young men who studied at Oxbridge, it was a career path, mm -hmm. you know, and you'd naturally go straight into some civil service job, and, and women weren't even allowed to study at Oxbridge yeah. until comparatively recently. So I think there was that sort of career path. Mm -hmm. um, but now, you know, in Manchester, for example, um, uh, Maria Balshaw, yeah. who's the overall director, there's some Julia Payton Jones, of course, who was at the Serpentine, yeah. Jenny Lomax at Camden, yeah. you know, I think, and Frances Morris yeah. is now yeah. director yeah. of Tate Modern. Yeah. So I think, you know, it's it's actually quite uh, optimistic time. Yeah. My my sense sometimes in societies like the Middle East, suddenly we're getting people like Sheikh Ahur or, or um, uh, in Saudi, uh, a princess in Saudi Arabia, and they are coming to the fore in championing mm -hmm. uh, the arts. But I think it's because they're seen as Marginal yeah. culture isn't really important. It's not a it's not a fit profession for a, for a macho guy. So it's like oh you women you get on with it you know. So I think there is also that, but I'm hoping that with the uh, certainly things like the Sharjah Biennale, which by the way is fantastic, that this is going to be an almost a, 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 an assault on patriarchy by stealth. <laughs> You know, no one thinks it matters very much, but actually, the more people go and look at this work and, and engage with it, hopefully the more there'll be social change. You know, we, we can only hope that art will change the world. Of course. Any more questions? Masha, yes, please. Um, um, as you were both representing from the galleries, so I'm interested where you both stand in the kind of gender focused exhibitions. <coughs> Because now here, like, it was all brought through, there was a lot of exhibitions happening like that in the 70s in the UK. And now the young generation is really conscious of that. They quite often saying we don't want to be really, as you say, we don't, for example, women only 
they show us. Mm -hmm. and, but in Russia, it's rough, I think, or well, Soviet territories, it's rough or opposite, like, because feminism has very uh, controversial, negative um, definition of that aspect kind of attached to it. So there is kind of almost impossible to do that because of that negativity. So it would be interesting to know what you think of that. Yeah, as a, as a person of the well, when I was a baby curator um, at the ICA, my boss, a visionary man called Sandy Nairn, programmed three exhibitions, one of which was curated by Lucy Lippard. It was called Issue. Another one was called About Time, and it was about performance. And the third was about women's images of men. And what those three exhibitions demonstrated was that by virtue of being excluded that all the artists in those all three all-women shows had created a new avant-garde. If they had been, they'd been relegated from the world of painting and sculpture, the canons. So what did they do? They, they used performance, moving image work, photography. They created a new avant-garde, and it was by virtue of their gender they'd been excluded. So actually, there is a logic to that which is if you're looking at great avant-gardes, feminism is one of them, one of the most important in the late 20th century. So I think there's that. The second thing is um, that there is a relation with lived experience. I don't think there is such a thing as you know, women's art, but there is a certain experience of life, and that will be reflected in modes of representation. And thirdly, you, know, you can't be what you can't see. And I think there's a responsibility to show young women from all over the world, you can be an artist, you can be a museum director. This is what it looks like. You know, this is the ambition that you can pursue. So for me, they, they, for those reasons, I think they still have merit. Of course, some people don't want to be, you know, ghettoized, but I, I, I sense that that's actually changing. There was a similar... Um, ethos around um, black and uh, Asian artists in the 80s and 90s when the whole debate around identity politics was taking place. And some people felt very uncomfortable being kind of corralled or ghettoized into uh, exhibitions which only showed, say, black artists. But again, you know, if you were from an Afro-Caribbean background, you came with, with a, a freight of history, of arrival, of otherness, of all of these experiences, and they were reflected in the work. So again, these have been very important watershed moments, I think, in raising <coughs> consciousness about lost voices or suppressed or hidden uh, spheres of, of uh, creativity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, speaking about the tragic of gallery, um, the Amazons of the avant-garde was like the yeah. only show which I did to follow this tendency that women artists are not being shown enough, so let's show them. Maybe uh, it's time to show the uh, Amazons of the avant-garde 21st century. <laughs> uh, you know, again, we are showing them. It doesn't matter. Like, for example, we just had finished the show of contemporary artist Irina uh, Zatulovska. She's a female. Uh, next year, we are doing a huge retrospective of Zinaida Serebrikova, who is the artist from the Silver Age mm -hmm. uh, time, and then she immigrated and worked in Paris. But we are doing her exhibition because she's a very interesting artist, and not because she's a woman. If she would be a man, uh, we would show her. And uh, I'm having some difficulties in trying to convince my colleagues. Like, as part of our museum, apart from these two huge buildings, we are having five smaller museums, which are artist houses. So we, are, uh, we have a, a studio museum of Anna Galupkina, whose name I had mentioned, a pupil of uh, Auguste Rodin, mm -hmm. uh, incredibly gifted sculptor who had devoted the whole of her life to the art. And I was trying to tell to my staff members, you should exploit that she's a woman sculptor. We have two other great women sculptors. The sculpture of Vera Mukhin is just behind on me, and plus Sara Lebedeva. You, you should exploit this idea, and they are asking, and why? Because they are women, and, and what's about it? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a little bit different uh, in, in Russia, and we are building our exhibition plans 
depending on what we consider important to show at the present moment, but frankly, not considering the gender of the artist or the artists. Mm -hmm. Yes, fine. What do you think, through this cultural period, the puzzles about a woman's question of fame, or anything that you think might be relevant? Um, because it's interesting to hear when you talk about you know, people don't concern themselves so much with the gender of the artist, whereas here there's so much emphasis on it. Um, so obviously the experiences have been quite different for 70 years. Um, I suppose, yeah. Uh, yeah, still I would like like add to what, I, to what I said, I totally agree with you that there are some issues which only female artists can expose, show, and talk about in their art. And these are very important issues. Um, so because of that, it might be really important to concentrate on this expression of something which women artists are exposing and showing and thinking about and are being uh, concerned. But again, the main thing is what the artist had accomplished, being male or, women or female. So if I had answered it. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, in so many revolutionary societies, the problem is the revolution is too fast. And so these huge gains, I mean, this is an amazing exhibition. And the representation of women is so extraordinary. But we know then also those things can go backwards. It's very fragile, these yeah. kinds of um, victories, if you like. And, and it takes a very, very long time for those to change. And I know that we've just had a series of displays of art from the Arab world. Well, Egypt was one of the most progressive um, you know, African countries in the world at one point, but then it went back. And so I think that's something to look at these examples and realize that it takes a long time for this kind of ethos to really be embedded in the wider society. And it seems to me that whenever you get sort of machismo in peril, then it tends to, we lose those rights again you know, that there's a reassertion of a power relation. So it's something that has to be really deeply embedded in education, in working practices, in every aspect of life, for it to truly uh, be a, a kind of status quo, if you like. But I do find these just absolutely exhilarating. It's a, it's a wonderful image of the superwoman, <laughs> um, if, you know, very historically based. So. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much. And please have, feel free to explore the exhibition in full. Thank you. Thank you.